So the first step of any install is ducting. And really what we're talking about here is twin wall ducting. For electrical installs, we want to ensure that it's black. Black's for electrical, blue would be for water, irrigation, etc. Yellow for gas, orange for traffic light systems, if you happen to have any of those in the garden, probably not. Purple for your data networks. But black is really what we want to concentrate on and it needs to be twin wall ducting. So here we've got a nice sturdy twin wall duct. We've got an outside wall and an interior wall that's a bit smoother that allows our cable to actually get down. With our ducting systems, what we need to do is we need to ensure that they are labelled and we need to ensure that after install, after our cable and everything's in, that we actually plug the ends of the duct, because that's really important, because if we don't do that, and let's say we've got a duct running, and imagine this is my plant room here, and I'm gonna run this all out to my garden, and I leave the duct open-ended, it becomes a nice rat run. And you imagine the plant room's nice and warm and dry, rats will absolutely love coming down your duct and coming into your customer's house. So we really need to ensure that those ducts are plugged. We also don't really want them to fill up with liquid and goop and all sorts of stuff like that because obviously it will become harder to pull extra cables in future. And finally, we also always want to leave a string in the duct after we've finished. So I'm going to install these duct tags and they take one or two cable ties and literally just go around like that. And that's the duct tag in place. And I'll just, I'm going to tag my second duct, which is already sealed in place just here. I'm going to just go through there and get that on there. There we go. Next, I need to actually label these ducts. Print that out. My tape is a little bit large for my duct. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just trim this down just because we're waiting for new tape to turn off at the moment. So I'll get that on there. Okay, that'll do for now. You get the idea. It's not exactly the um, correct tape that we want to be using for this duct, but it does the job. I'm gonna pull this ducting actually in place into the back of my rig, which would be the same as if you were putting it out to a, a separate zone in the garden. Right, one duct in place, and that duct is our duct one. I pull my second duct in place now. It just happens to be that it's going to the same place. For this, to get our string actually in the duct, what we're going to need, we're going to need our normal five or six mil nylon string, and we're going to need a cheap and cheerful plastic bag, not the long life stuff. We need the ones that we're going round and killing all the turtles out there. We want to take our bag, just form it into a nice, thin section of bag and we want to tape or not the string around the bag itself. Now I normally do prefer to use some PVC electrical tape. If you've got a particularly long length of run sometimes you have to pull through something thinner like um, a thick like sea line fishing, fishing wire or something similar like that and then use that to actually pull the string through. You can also use a um, nylon wire and try and push it down but you can only really go about 10 meters with that. This method you'll get a lot further. There we go. So what we do is we take our plastic bag, we feed that down the duct. Just feed it, feed it down some way. I don't want it to get stiff but I just want just the start of the rope just to go in there. If I'm on my own and there's no one else to actually hold on to the end of the rope, what I want to do is tie my rope either as a knot or, as I prefer, I like to tie a little loop around the actual duct itself, which is really useful for in future, stop it from pulling through. So I've got that on there and because I'm on my own, I'm going to leave that and I'm just going to get my Henry Hoover or similar on the end of the duct and we'll pull that string through. And there we go. We have our string coming through the duct there. So that gives us something that we can actually then tie our cable to and pull that through. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to take another piece of string that's going to come through our duct and the cable that we're actually going to pull through. So we're going to take the two, bring them together and come on to our duct string that's on here and we're going to tie on around about there and then we can pull all that through the duct whilst leaving a string already in its place. 
Now this pulling the cable through really is a two person job, so I'm gonna bring in my glamorous assistant. I'm ready. Don't believe a word of it. Let's go. Let's go in. So what I've done there is I've pulled in that cable along with a string for any future additions to the system. So you've done your first fix, your cables are in place, your ducting's in place, and you're returning for the second fix. First thing I would actually do is actually install all of the physical light fittings. In this particular case, I'm just gonna just install two light fittings. So I'm gonna have a halo on this uh, paving here. So I'm just gonna install that and whatever I was running with regards to those little ducts in here or anything else to get back to a central joint box. Ideally, you don't have any any joints that are like directly below the fittings or anything. You want to get back uh, to as few joint boxes as possible. So you could order the lights with a custom cable length to ensure that that actually happens. And it'll make your life so much easier when it comes to actual maintenance. So you've got your cables back to your relevant joint box. Now, there's lots of different brands of joint boxes that you can use. There's you know, your likes of G-Wiz and there's Whisker in this particular case that I've got here. I'm gonna use a Whisker 308 box. The useful thing with Whisker is that you can quite easily get these glands straight in there. Um, I'll just break out that inner membrane first and then get that, get that gland all the way through. You don't have to use the glands. You can just run the cable through the membrane, but it's not really recommended because you don't really have any strain relief. But if you absolutely needed to do that, you just make a very small puncher, just get the cable through and then use a cable tie on the inside to actually secure the cable to stop it from coming through. I'm gonna run my relevant lights actually into my box. So I'm gonna come in, stuffing glands here, and I'm gonna use a little whisker spanner, it could be a water pump plier or similar, just to nip up the, the glands here, get them nice and tight. I don't wanna over tighten them. We don't really want the membrane of the inside of the gland popping out of the gland itself. So it's, it's not as tight as we can actually do it, it's just as tight as it's really securing the cable. Which is about there. Same with our second one. There we go, that's our two cables for our two lights, but we also need to deal with our supply cable. So there is our supply cable there. I um, will pre-strip this and then I'll run this actually through into the box. Now in this case, I'm using four core PVC cable. I only need to use two cores for the first circuit I'm doing. I can use the other two cores for another circuit or I can leave them spare for any future additions. And the really useful thing is with 350 milliamp series wiring is I can go over a kilometer at 0.5 milliconductor size and this is 0.75 so I can go even further uh, or I can go over a bigger load. So I'm going to get this cable actually in. my cables inside. Now for the circuit I'm actually wiring up here I'm actually going to use brown and grey and I'm going to sleeve them appropriately so what I want to do is because it's extra low voltage I want to sleeve these actually red and black so I'm going to grab some red and black sleeving and actually sleeve these. over the uh, brown there. Polarity matters actually so much so that uh, if we don't wire them around the wrong way, um, or if we don't wire them around the right way, lights won't actually work, uh, or you may even blow them up. Need some Wagos now to connect these up, or I could use connect block, but in my case I'm gonna use Wagos. If this was constant voltage, we would just literally just have all our reds together and all our blacks together, and that would be that. Because this is actually series wiring, the way that we do this is if I start at my supply, which is my circuit one, I go into my light one, out of my light one, black, as you can see here, into my light two, out of my light two, and return. There should never be any more than two cores in each connector. 
And as you can see, when you pull it all apart, you can see really clearly how that's in a nice series loop. So that is how you do your series wiring. Red into red, out of the black, into the next red, out of the black and back. If this box is gonna remain flat like this in our installation, I would gel this. If it was gonna actually go on some sort of spike or be mounted to the wall, it was gonna be in this position, then I would just literally just put a little hole in the box or I'd use cortex membrane or similar to allow the box to actually breathe. I'm just going to just pop the lid back on there. And pop that away. Now ideally what you'd be doing is labelling all the cables going through because it makes it so much easier in terms of maintenance later down the line. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to prep this so that I can wire this up for this driver but I'm also going to use this driver later on as well so I'm going to make this fairly long just to allow for that. So we are using the brown core and the grey core. We're not currently using the uh, green yellow and the black. And again, what I need to do is ensure that these are actually sleeved red and black. So there we go, nice piece of red sleeving on there, black sleeving on there. On the driver, we've actually got indicated polarity. You can see here we've got a negative there and we've got a positive there. So our black, which is our negative, needs to go in to the terminal here. Our red, which is positive, needs to go into the terminal here. There we go. Now we need to do the 230 volt side. And we've got a line of neutral connections there and there. And I'm going to wire this into our Quinetic, which is just up here, and feed this all up of here. I'm going to get some singles to do that. There we go. Pop that up there, pop that back up there. Strip these. I'm just doing our feed out to our lights at the moment. So that is L out on there, and there, and a neutral. Just come in and just sweep into there. Yeah. Pop my cover on there just to secure my conductors in place. And I'm going to wire up my line and neutral on this side. I just need to turn my power off. back on and there we go there's our lights in place and you can see that they are working just as expected so during the design process we would have determined what our designed voltage draw would have been on a 350 milliamp si system now what we actually need to do is actually measure the outgoing voltage to ensure that that roundabout matches what we expect or highlight if there's any particular issues so assuming that my halo light was a 1.6 watt and my micro path marker was 1.6 watt, I'm expecting around about nine volts on the outgoing of this. So I just take a literally multimeter, put in voltage on DC, and I'm just gonna put my two probes just inside here and just measure what the actual outgoing voltage is. I'm actually getting 11.87, which while I'm doing this tells me that the path marker is actually 2.6 watts. Now the way you do that calculation is you take the designed wattage of the entire circuit and you divide by the current. So for example, we've got here 4.2 watts. We divide 4.2 by 350 milliamp or 4.2 divided by 0.35 and we get about 12 volts. So 11.85 volts is within what we expect.